Imagine the hottest day you can remember. The day I'm going to tell you about was even hotter than that. The ground was parched, dry, no shade, no reprieve from the hot sun. Yet hundreds of thousands of desperate people were on a mass migration for survival. It was northern Somalia in the mid-1980s. Hundreds of thousands of people had come to the refugee camps there seeking help. It was quiet, eerily quiet. I guess when you're exhausted, starving, scared, uncertain, there's really not much to say. Even the babies, hungry and wanting, joined this chorus of silence. I wondered, what were the conditions they left behind that this new place, the arid, isolated land of Somalia, was better than the old? My husband and I were young aid workers at that time, working to help the Ethiopian refugees that were there in the camp. My husband said he had to go to the camp to check on the food distribution system. So I said I would go with him and bring our young four-month-old baby with us. I really didn't know what I was thinking. When I got out of the Land Cruiser, really in the middle of nowhere, I stood there holding my young, healthy, happy, chubby, white baby. I looked around the camp. Everybody was exhausted. Everybody was hungry. And I stood there holding my chubby baby of joy who never was hungry and who never wanted for anything. I could feel thousands of eyes fixed on us. And I felt ashamed. I guess it's the same kind of feeling people have if they survive some kind of tragedy. People call it survivor's guilt. You know, you wonder, why are you so lucky? Why are you not them? Why my baby, not their baby? In my more than 30 years of working and traveling to some of the poorest countries of the world, I never forgot that day. I never forgot that it put in my mind the huge disparities in the world, the huge gulf between the rich and the poor. And I can understand why many people will think that gulf will never close. But I know that gulf isn't as wide as it used to be, not at all. Since 1990, the world has made significant progress in reducing extreme poverty. A significant point, a significant turning point of that happened in the fall of 2000. At that time, almost 200 leaders from around the world gathered for the Millennium Summit. Surprisingly to many people, they were able to come to agreement on a few key things, a few key priorities that would reduce the amount of poverty in the world and bring improved living standards to billions of people. These standards became known as the Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, a set of eight, just eight priorities that would work towards reducing poverty, improving health and education, and importantly, making progress by 2015. So, what progress has been made? The number of children dying, number of children under five dying, has dropped by 41%. Two billion more people have access to clean drinking water. Mortality rates from malaria has dropped, have dropped by 25% between 2000 and 2010. Primary school enrollment has increased to 90%. And the number of people surviving, barely, on $1.25 a day, that number has been cut in half. The reason these Millennium Development Goals helped was simple. It was the first time that everyone, government leaders, the UN, donors, international NGOs, and local communities had the same focus, the same goals that they could work cooperatively on. These goals became targets, and targets became plans, and plans got funded. Yes, not enough funding, but funding nonetheless. Monitoring systems were set up to see how we were doing. Data was collected. Reports were written. And National pride, a good thing, came into play. What leader of a country would not want to stand up to the world and say, we have reached MDG1 and cut hunger in our country by half? 
Now that 2015 is practically here, world leaders are discussing what's next. What should be in the new set of goals that we should develop? Two important thoughts are influencing that discussion. First, although a lot of progress has been made, we still have a long way to go. And progress is improving, it, things are improving, but yet one in eight people around the world are still severely undernourished, and one in four children are malnourished. So let's keep to the task at hand and get the job done. Second, since the original goals were done, concern about climate change has only continued to grow. So there's growing momentum now to bring the idea of reducing poverty and climate change together into one set of manageable goals. And the connection is right clear, because those who are most poor are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And these new goals will be applicable to all countries of the world, including the US. So that is one reason you should care about what will be in these goals. But I think there's another reason, a greater reason to care. I think the world forgot something very important when it created the original MDGs. I think it forgot the threats to the youngest and most vulnerable amongst us, children, come not only from having too little food, but also from having too much violence in your lives, in their lives. Children not only need to survive, but they need to have a world safe for them to thrive. Sexual violence, exploitive child labor, early enforced marriage, armed conflict, physical violence are all real and daily threats to millions of children around the world. Four years ago, Child Fund started surveying children around the world, asking them their opinions on key issues. Our Small Voices Big Dream survey asked children about this issue of violence. Why did they think so much violence was directed towards them? More than half of the children surveyed said they believed it was, they attributed this violence to the bad behavior of adults, including the use of drugs and alcohol. These same children said that if they became leaders in their country, they would prior, prior, prioritize increasing law and order in their country in order to provide more protection to children. So what is the extent of this problem of violence? We know abuse is exacerbated within developing countries. When parents are living in poverty, it forms a huge emotional stress on parents, and children are often at the end of that stress when they reach a tipping point. Sexual violence against girls, very little girls, happens often, and often nothing is done about it because the perpetrator is someone within the family. Children are often forced into child prostitution. The UN estimates there are one million girls being exploited that way these days. Children are also forced into armed conflict, often recruited on either side of the conflict. One in nine girls in the developing world are married before the age of 15. Still others are sold to tra traffickers who send them on to sweatshops, factories, workhouses. The UN estimates that the number of child laborers in the world is almost 215 million. Not long ago, I met a young boy in India. He worked making bangles, bracelets. It involved melting glass open, over an open flame. It was dangerous work. It was taking a toll on him. His hands looked as worn and old as an old man's hands. His family kept him out of school to do this job because they depended on his income. He was an economic asset to the family. Girl brides are also an asset. Many fathers sell their daughter's hand in marriage without, of course, their consent. It reminds me of a young girl, Nazifa, in Afghanistan, 12 years old. She was sold for marriage for the equivalent of $2,000 by her grandfather to a man that was 72 years old. But to me, it really didn't make a difference how old that man was. It was still the fact that this was a young girl, 12 years old, that was forced to wed. Even in the US, violence occurs against children. Our children are particularly, particularly susceptible to gun violence. That became very clear to me one cold and windy day in April 2007. I was in my first board meeting as president of Child Fund, and my assistant told me my son was on the phone. A college student, he rarely called me at work, 
Usually it was to tell me that he got an A on some paper or most likely to ask me for money. You know how college <laughs> students are. But when I picked up the phone, it wasn't my son. It was the emergency room doctor telling me that my son had been shot four times. That's him. So that young boy, that young baby, who spent the first year of his life in Somalia, became a victim and thankfully a survivor of the worst mass shooting in US history, the shooting at Virginia Tech. 32 people were killed that day. 27 of them were students, children of other mothers and fathers. I'm guessing the stories I've told you today have invoked some kind of reaction in you. The work of Child Fund really depends upon our capacity to evoke that reaction. That reaction is full of emotions of compassion and caring and generosity. And we're able to turn those reactions into actions that helped last year 18 million children and family members around the world. Now let's take that word reaction, that powerful word, and add a hyphen to it, reaction. As in taking action over and over again, because that is what is needed if we are to make a significant difference in reducing the amount of violence in the lives of children. It is not enough to react once to violence. You have to act over and over again to make a significant difference. There is a place to focus your reaction. Voices are being raised in many parts of the world right now talking about what should be in these new goals. There is an intense conversation happening. So if you care about reducing the amount of violence in children, if, in, for children, if you care and you think it's smart to have all the countries in the world to work together to reduce the worst forms of violence, child labor, child trafficking, and early child marriage, then you need to act now and you need to keep acting by telling and getting other people to get involved. One way you can do that is to join the global campaign, Free From Violence. It is advocating to world leaders that the new goals that will be prepared should include reducing violence against children. These goals are being prepared now and will be presented to the UN in September 2015 for their approval. We have seen so much encouraging progress in helping lift people out of poverty, in increasing access to education and health care, and instilling solutions for a better life. There is still a long way to go, but many countries are on the right path. We should prioritize ending violence because we owe it to the world's children. Today, there are children being hurt, abused, and exploited. But most important, they are losing something that you and I have taken for granted, the opportunity to be a child. I hope your reaction will lead to reaction, and you will join us in spreading the idea that we should help keep the world's most vulnerable children free from violence. Thank you.